Hello and welcome back to Elden Ring Ultimate Guide Part 40. Today it is Consecrated Snowfield Part 2. And this episode is starting off with us setting up a specific build. And that is we're going to put on the um, the Thunderbolt spam build, I guess you could say. So we're putting Thunderbolt Ash of War on, we're putting the Dex tier on, we're putting on the Lightning Damage uh, tier on and our Physic Flask. We will uh, put on the, um, the Lightning Scorpion charm, we just kind of forgot. Uh, but you'll see why... You'll see when we do it. Anyway, so we're now running east down the um, empty riverbed. I think that's what this is, this ravine area. And um, there's going to be a couple of uh, dodgy edits, as you can see. But hopefully you can kind of follow along with what we're doing. We're just heading uh, down to the end, the end of this ravine where there is a boss. Now, this boss is Magma Worm Theodorix. And this motherfucker might possibly do the most single hit damage of any enemy in the game. He can, even at 60 Vigor, can like almost one shot you, uh, which is why, fuck him. So what we're going to do is we're just going to spam Lightning Bolt at him from up here, and this is actually more than enough to take care of him. Uh, it's actually pretty great that there's this little ledge here, because otherwise he is very, very tough, because he can just kill you out of nowhere. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and that is us. true. And there we put the Lightning Scorpion Charm on. So from here, just go to town on L2. There you go, done. Uh, he is effectively dead from this point onwards. But when you think about it, this is... Um, it could have been made even more efficient with perhaps if we just used Rot Breath on him. That would have been good. Um, now, you could also use the Rot Turret build um, for the, the, uh, the Mimic tier. Don't get me wrong, that would have been a completely uh, fine thing to do. Uh, but basically just because of the amount of swapping back and forth it would have had to have, we would have had to have done in order to facilitate that uh, we just figured fuck it Thunderbolt spam is good enough uh, you know why fix what isn't broke you know yeah as you said you could have also rotted him uh, that would have been good you could have poisoned him from up here you could have been hurling black flame fireballs at him um, you could have summoned Tish, and Tish could have been hitting him with Destined Death. Like, make no mistake, Theodorix is tanky. So any way you can uh, manipulate his big health bar to deal lots of damage very quickly. So anything that deals percentage-based damage would be great here. Um, Bleed, Frostbite, um, all of these tools. The reason we didn't get down and dirty with him is because, like you said, does a lot of single-hit damage, so he could very easily have just one-shot us out of nowhere. Well, that's where all those edits came from, each edit other than this part, so that's... It, I'm pretty sure he killed us at least twice, but I think it was three times. Uh, we go to kill him, and he just, you know, we're doing fine, and randomly he just, like, just one-shots us. Um, so for that, we get an Ancient Dragon Smith and Stone, and a Dragon Heart, and also there's some more... There's another thing available at the uh, Dragon Communion. Um, you know, the little... Yeah, Theodorix is Magma. Place. Yeah. So, there is another way of beating Theodorix, which is kind of interesting, and you can just get the octopuses to do it for you. So, what you do is use your bow, or darts, or whatever, uh, to bait the octopuses into this kind of middle portion of the arena, and then you can shoot Theodorix and bait him down. Uh, I, I guess you could bait the, the octopuses up further, but they're, it's, it's an extremely slow process doing this overall. But yeah, you can just... Um, get all the octopuses in one area, and then they aggro on him and do an insane amount of boys damage to him. <laughs> I want to apologise for the, the crunchiness of the footage, because this footage is actually mine, and I don't have like a capture card or means to record high-quality footage, so this is just a save from PlayStation gameplay, but look what they're doing to it! They just delete him. Done. Yeah. Fight's over. GG. <laughs> Alright, so now we are back to my footage, and before we head into this cave here, I think this is the Cave of the Forlorn, yes? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, so there's another rock that we need to bash open. And again, you know, you just get a, a big enemy to bash the rock open to get its juicy innards. The problem is, is that all the enemies in this area are excruciatingly slow. So yeah, this is why I sped this footage up. It was impossibly horrible to watch. Don't even bother with the octopuses, they're even slower than the crab. So hit the crab over and bring that over to the, the rock here. Despite the fact I don't know what was up with this fucking crab, it was just, it was just did not want to cooperate. Very very irritating. But we're just gonna hit the crab and periodically bring it closer and closer to this rock, and eventually he will. 
attack it and it'll break it open. Now again, we have mentioned that there's the quit out method where theoretically you don't even need to do this. Just head up next to the rock, quit out and then load back in. And um, to stop you getting stuck in geometry, like so say you break a box or something and then you load back in, to stop you getting stuck in the box, it will break every breakable item around you when you load back into the game. So theoretically that involves those, uh, those um, statues as well. So when you load back in, it should break the statue and you, can, you should be able to just get the smithed stones inside. Hopefully. It doesn't work with everyone in the game, but it might work with that one, so it's worth trying. So now we use the stone sword key, we're in Cave of the Forlorn, and it's at this point in the game where we highly, 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 re I mean, we've been saying it for a three parts now, but we highly recommend you take off the Radigan Sword Seal and replace it with, uh, like, the Dragon Crest Talisman plus two. You're definitely going to see good returns on your defense because not only are you taking less damage like you're not taking the extra damage from the sword seal but you're then taking less damage from the actual defense talisman itself so that is the recommended thing to do so now we're just sticking lion's claw back on as replacement for uh thunderbolt we're then putting our our normal um our normal uh tears into the physic flask and there we go we're, we're taking the the sword seal off I know another bit of a weird edit there, but you're just going to deal with it for this part. And now we're heading into the Cave of the Forlorn. That's, that's us. We're, we're ready to do this. The enemies in this area, in this cave specifically, can just hit like an absolute fucking truck. Like, it's actually crazy. Um, but they would be hitting a lot harder if you were still wearing the saw seal. Um, which is, again, another fucking edit. Um, this is again why we recommend taking it off, especially at this point, because as you can see, like a single hit from Lion's Claw isn't one-shotting these guys, and they are just misbegotten, and you would be expecting it to one-shot them. Um, yeah. It no longer does. So... This is why um, Vigor's the most important stat in this game. I mean, even these rats are doing a, a kind of oddly high amount of damage. So I think we, did we put on the, the Crimson Amber Medallion? Not the Crimson Amber Medallion, but the one that gives you more HP from heals as well. Yeah, I think we have that plus the uh, the, the Dragon Crest Talisman on. Yeah, we do. Crimson Seed is what it's called. Um, yes, yes. Speaking of the enemies in this cave, we do, Misbegotten, we do. They, they can drop the um, Iron Cleaver, the Misbegotten Shortbow, whichever one they're wielding, uh, Old Fangs. I think they can drop Beast Blood, and the slightly larger ones can drop the Long Haft Axe, which is a very decent weapon. So if you get any of their gear to drop, to be honest, it's all worth it. So yeah, the reason why we're not wearing the um, the full Lionel's armor set is because with this specific setup of um, talismans and equipment, uh, we aren't able to wear his helmet, which is a little bit annoying. But eh, yeah, like, fine. I mean, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, once we get the, um, I think we we get something that allows us to put it back on again. But I can't remember what it is. But so true yeah, like plus two, I would imagine. I imagine it must be that. Yeah, that we don't get that for a while. So I guess we're just wearing this for now. Obviously, you can like take off the bow or something if you really want to, and you can that and that would totally work as well. So heading up this for sure, way, you here, definitely don't need that. it all equipped at the same time. Nah, nah. So there's a little jump you can do here to get this item. Uh, a little awkward, but that's fine. It is quite crazy just how strong the Misbegotten in this cave are, uh, particularly the ones with the long half axe. They can deal an insane amount of damage if you're wearing the sword seal. Uh, so, yeah. I, it, this is the point where it is definitely recommended that you don't have it on, but uh, I recommend you probably take it off once you get to Mountaintops of the Giants. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, Cave of the Fallen is kind of an interesting one because you can see through the floor and there's a bunch of jellyfish underneath you. It's quite visually interesting. This is one of the more um, uniquely designed cave dungeons in the game. Yeah, it's really strange though because the boss in this dungeon is fucking nothing despite the fact that, like, see if you just had to fight, like, five of these, it would be one of the... Like, five of these guys scaled to this strength would be, like... Hardle and Melania. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> it fucking would be. Um, this uh, dungeon's boss actually irritates me because this is the third Leonine Misbegotten that has one of the legendary armaments. 
Wait, One's so holding deep. the Grafted Blade oh Greatsword, one's got the Ruins Greatsword in Redmain Castle, and this one has the Golden Order Greatsword. <laughs> Three of the legendary weapons are held by Leonine Misbegotten. It's a fucking joke. So, the actual, to actually get to the boss in this part is actually kind of hidden away. You have to do this weird jump over a wall that's extremely not apparent, like, whatsoever. So yeah, you need to You'll do know you're in the right here. place when you see the Mikola's Lily on top of the structure in the middle of the room. Yes. So yeah, you can just drop, drop down here, you won't take any damage. Um, and yeah, we, we also, I think we died to the boss as well. I, I mean, this was just as, we really... Yeah, we really should have re-recorded the footage for this, but uh, we weren't able to. So we, we were riding the with a bunch of edits. Here. Yeah. I don't know if this was worse than Volcano Manor for riding the struggle bus. This this is oh. this this was the worst. Volcano Manor was just a bit annoying. Uh this was just like actively sloppy. So yeah, we do apologize for the footage. I mean all the strategies are legit by the way. It was just um I just don't know what the fuck was going on. Because we end up missing that item. Because the fucking we had to fight the jellyfish, so yeah, this is me dying to the boss. Uh, don't worry, we get the item. I, it's crazy. I just get fucking clipped and just fucking dead. Epic. Love that. <laughs> right, so now a jellyfish didn't fall down the fucking hole that I have to deal with. I can now get the item. Very frustrating. It was just an extreme, extremely bad variance, like, constantly for this part. Um, and because I hadn't backed the save up before recording, it meant that I wasn't able to redo it without doing, like, the whole of Snowfield. Yeah. RNG was really not on your side here. No, no. As I said, so, the Leonine Misbegotten. Its moveset is functionally identical to every other Leonine Misbegotten you fought up to this point, except it does have a big AoE and a double swipe. Now, um, the thing is, not that is you're going to get to see it, because we fucking shredded him. Yeah, so strictly speaking, when it comes to this, the Leonine Misbegotten, every hit we do staggers it. So you can actually just summon the Mimic to your and then hit it every time after the Mimic tier hits it to keep it effectively stunned forever. So I really don't know how it managed to kill me when it's really that easy. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it was pretty pretty self-explanatory what to do there. I know that there uh, I mean, one, you fought these bosses before. Two, jumping L1s or Lion's Claw is absolutely fine once you've got the Mimic tier out. So yeah, you, sh you should be fine. You should be fine. So, from the, the snow... here, though. Yes. so from the snowfield grace, we're heading southwest to this big tree. We get a uh, golden rune 13. And then there's a talisman around the back. Can't remember what one it is. Uh, one of the horn charms, I think. Stalwart horn charm plus one. Very nice. That's bleeding frostbite resistance, I believe. And then from here, we are heading up to the yellow ruins. Oh, yellow ruins, yeah. rather. I think it is yellow, just spelled weird. Oh, yeah? Yellow okay. Annex Ruins. Yeah. Um, you know, yellow, so, like yellow embers, the, yeah, the frenzy yeah, yeah. crafting material. So, now, in here, there's very few items. There was a golden rune in the the middle part, but then we just take a jump on the this kind of like a ruins on the wall, and you jump from that into these uh, kind of like a box rune, and the only way to get into it is from the jump, and then uh, down the stairs, and we get the, uh, what was that, unending frenzy or something like that. Yeah. Be careful of these enemies, by the way. Um, they can frenzy you. They can use the the flame of frenzy incantation on you effectively, and it can stun lock you, then hit you with the madness, and then just kill you. It hits extremely hard, so try not to get uh, caught out by that. Grabbing a smithing so, stone there, yeah. but unendurable frenzy um, is uh, like the flame of frenzy, except if you hold it, it just keeps going. So if you've got the FP for it and the faith, it hits really, really hard. It's very, very powerful. So from what I remember, this particular tunnel uh, does have quite a lot of good things in it. And not only that, we actually have to fight a... Uh... Oh god, there's another um, Astel boss in this tunnel, um, which does cheap Miraculously, Astel. that fall yeah. did not kill you. 
Uh, so there's also a bunch of smith and stone eights in the wall, uh, probably I mean, various sizes of smith and stone, but just beware because they're, they're kind of harder to see. Uh, they kind of blend in with the kind of ice motif in this tunnel. So just uh, keep an eye out, watch exactly what we're doing and what we're picking up. But otherwise, yeah, there's just a bunch of frozen miners. Uh, these are just normal miners, so these will just drop the pickaxe and these ones specifically will drop the gravel stones. And uh, they can drop smithing stones of various sizes as well. Uh, probably by the by the looks here, by notes, uh, six, seven, and eights they can drop in this one. It's true. There's also a couple of old men in underwear down here. I believe there's one alabaster lord, one onyx lord. Yes. Um, and they're usually guarding something good. One of them guards the exit, and the other one's down here and guards an ancient dragon smithing stone, I believe. Um. This is also where you get the second of the two possible um, Alabaster Lord swords, so you can actually power stance that if you so choose. These guys were already a joke, but Lion's Claw renders them even further so. Yep, this because is Because he just actually... can't do anything. <laughs> yeah, no, he just can't. I mean, he, the, the amount of damage he done through our Lion's Claw was just nothing. Just done nothing. So there's two Smith and Stone Knights we picked up there, so yeah, just pay attention. And then I think we just take the ladder up and then continue along. Yeah, it's fairly straightforward, Yellow Addicts Tunnel. Um, it is kind of cool, though, because you have to jump down a broken lift at the start, so you are sort of trapped down here until you get to the end of the dungeon, and then there's a shortcut that leads you back to the start. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. Not so, so bad what? in terms of the yeah. way it's laid out. And there's a somber smith and stone eight. I think it's definitely worthwhile coming here simply for the fact that you get so many smith and stone eights in here. So chances are you're able to uh, probably fully upgrade at least one of your weapons after coming here. Yeah, even if you uh, didn't fight the boss, like even if you had no interest in fighting the boss, just coming here for the smithing stones is probably worth it. Oh yeah, they all got the pickaxe as well. Cool. Very nice. But yeah, when it comes to the boss, like we said, it's another Astel boss, so uh, we did the same things on last time, and we used the, the rot turret setup, and it's very, very effective. Lion's Claw giving absolutely zero fucks about the Onyx Lord's attack there. Literally zero fucks. I mean, again, he hit us whilst we were in the middle of a Lion's Claw, didn't hit us out Lion's Claw, and then... I have a feeling we take less damage as well. Like, I, can't, I don't know for certain, but it just feels like we take less damage through Alliance Claw. Yeah, maybe. Um, there are a couple of Ashes of War, actually, that modify your damage resistance. Like, Endure gives you a huge amount of damage resistance when you first pop it, so I wouldn't be surprised sure. if Alliance Claw did as well. But I can't confirm that for sure. So that was three Smith and Stone Eights and another Somber Eight. So, yeah, I mean, Christ, we've picked up, like, fucking eight Smith and... There's another one. So that's, like, probably about eight Smith and Stone Eights just from this one area. So yeah, definitely worthwhile coming here. So now we're going to head back to the Grace to uh, get our equipment set up in order to do the boss. So obviously that involves changing up what we're using quite extensively. But, you know, it makes Astel a nice, uh, you know, piece of piss. So here we go. We have, uh, we've got uh, our Great Stars with, now, we're using Lion's Claw that you should be using Storm Ruler, or Storm Caller rather. You should be using Storm Caller, not Lion's Claw. Um, but otherwise, we have our uh, the Icon Shield, the Dragon Communion Seal, and the Blessed Dew Talisman. Yeah, just for that little bit of extra survivability for the Mimic. Um, speaking of, this time round we don't have the Royal Remains set on, and I don't know if we put it on, and I think it's because we determined that actually having the higher defences at this point outpaces the healing below 20%. Maybe, uh, yeah, I'm kind of, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure why we've got the royal remains set on either, but that is what it is. Now, chances are you should probably summon the mimic after it does that attack. It does that attack every time as soon as you walk in, so just beware of that. But otherwise, now the mimic will only be doing rot breath to this thing, and um, and yeah, now you can just run up to it and start spamming storm, uh, storm caller at it, which. Again, you should be using Stormcaller, not Lion's Claw. Lion's Claw is still fine, don't get me wrong, but yeah, that's what that's what you should be doing. <laughs> I don't know why I forgot that uh, Stormcaller was just so good against this thing. Eh, I, I think 
by this apparently, point we have reached the dealer's choice area. Yeah. Apparently I'm using Bloodblade instead, which admittedly is actually quite good against that still. Uh, don't get me wrong. Like I said, dealer's choice. We have so many tools available to us now that it's really just give it a shot and see what works for you. Um, you'll see Bloodblade and Rot doing work for us, but if you don't like this strategy for whatever reason, you have Stormcaller, you have Lion's Claw, you have um, standing away from it and spamming the Black Knife Ash of War, or, you know. Yeah, I'm pretty sure the reason why I was using Bloodblade was just to show off Bloodblade rather than um, Stormcaller being better or worse. Because obviously I can just, you've already seen us do it with Stormcaller, so this is just like an alternative method. But now that, I mean, now this is rotted, like, I mean, the main thing for Astel is the the rot turret on the Mimic more than anything. Yeah, for sure. Like, that didn't change between Estelle's. We're still using the rot turret because it's just too good to not use. Um, I, mean, I mean, the rot turret has done more damage than we have, I think, honestly. Oh, for sure. Like, seemingly, anyway. Um, Although, blood, I will mention... blood putting in the work. True. True. I will mention this Estelle actually is different from the other Estelle we've already fought because this one has a unique grab attack. So the other one could teleport and then appear behind you and grab you and bite you. This one can teleport away and then like eight of it will come out of the ceiling. So unless you time your dodge perfectly, you just get one shot. Um, I don't think I've ever survived it. If I've been hit with the grab, I've just died. Um, so try and avoid that if you can. So now we're just sticking our main equipment on. Um, yeah, so I guess that just highlights that you can do kind of whatever you want to a style, but the main thing is having the rot turret on the go, and then just, you know, whatever, whatever's going to put damage into it. But mostly, like, something that's, like, got a big, wide hitbox. Bloodblade's good because it actually, like, targets and homes in on what it is that you're targeting so uh you can kind of just spam it and not even look at what you're doing and it generally hits so it's quite cool in that sense likewise thunderbolt could have been quite good there uh, i think we tried um, thunderbolt and it done barely any damage i'm pretty sure that's what we tried the, the there was an edit we tried one attempt before that so i would say don't use thunderbolt uh because maybe memory, if you were more terrible. geared towards it if you were doing a dex build it said maybe, maybe. It'd be better uh, although, with the Great Stars, my personal recommendation would be just to use Stormcaller, but that is what it is. For sure. Uh, Spectral Lands could have also been good. Anywho, back in the Yellow Annex Ruins. Um, and we're really heading just over to the other side, grabbing some items along the way. And then this room is one of the most dangerous rooms in the entire game. Yeah. The rats in here inflict madness, you get pursued by enemies behind you. Yeah, um, boxed in, absolutely rinsed, dead. <laughs> so something to bear in mind actually is we put wild strikes on our um on our great stars when we were switching our equipment uh, and the reason for that is there's an npc fight coming up so yeah just be aware of this room uh because if we had lion's claw we could probably have gotten out of that room but because we had wild strikes on we weren't able to kill the rats so uh yeah. or indeed stormcaller would have probably done the trick there <laughs> Oh yeah, Stormcaller would have, would have been 360 yeah. around you. Oh, there was the frenzy attack. Yeah, don't get hit by that. It really hurts. Yeah, just don't even <laughs> fight. The, don't, don't even like fight the guys in those runes, to be honest, because, like you said, it. If they even gang up on you slightly, they're pretty much guaranteed to kill you. Uh, so yeah, so now we're heading to this tree here that is surrounded by all like the, the red plants, and at this point we will get invaded by a uh, sanguine noble. Which is why we have the Wild Strikes on, because obviously Wild Strikes good against NPCs. There he is. Finally decides to show up. And... He's dead. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And there he goes. Night, night. <laughs> and for that, we get the Sanguine set. Very nice. Sanguine Noble sets, I mean, if nothing else, it's really pretty. But um, I believe it offers pretty high bleed resistance. So head northeast, and then there's some dogs. We get some crystal darts, and now there is uh, some rune bears floating about. But thankfully, I don't think we don't need to kill any of these rune bears. Um, so we can just run past them. There is one rune bear that we do need to, we might need to kill though. And there's a hero's rune too. And now we are jumping over here. 
And this is the actual entrance to get to Moog's Palace. So this teleports you into this little tunnel here. So all we're going to do is we're just going to head to uh, the first grace, just so we can walk back here. This is just to kind of show you that this is how you get to Moog's Palace. And this is a little bit... It's very, this place is very interesting because it's it feels like a legacy dungeon, but you can run about torrent on it. Weird. Yeah, I do quite like this area. For exactly that reason, actually. Just yeah. grabbing the first few items in the area, so... Um, we've at least gotten something out of coming here. Um, instead of just having the grace. Now, I think and then it'll be straight back to you... Snowfield, I think. We're going to very quickly show you the best farming method in the game. And it is uh, this big crow here. Shoot some arrows at it from up here. Um, and it just uh, runs off just runs off the side. And, and that's 10k. Runes. If you are if you have a golden pickled fowl foot active and you have the uh, gold scarab equipped, that's about 17,000. And sure. if you have all that and it has the glowing eyes effect, you get about 80,000 runes when that thing dies. It yeah, is uh, so. very, very efficient. As you can see, one arrow, so something that cost, what, 40 runes? Just netted you 10,000. Um, yeah, so good return on investment, I will say. 100%, yeah. So if you are short on levels or you're short on smithing stones because you want to try some other weapons out or what have you, that is the singular best farm in the game. It is the most rune-efficient farm per minute of time in the entire game. So, warping back to Inner Consecrated Snowfield, we're now just going to head back down the uh, frozen riverbed. At least, I, again, I think that's what it is. <laughs> Certainly what it looks like. So, we're putting on the uh, the magic defense talisman now. Uh, just because there's like a certain thing, there's like a, there's a wandering mausoleum that just spits out a whole load of like magic bolts. So, getting hit by one of them can be pretty can be pretty tough, so we are just going to put on the, the defense talisman just to kind of mitigate that a little bit. Big Kappa Cannoneer vibes. Yeah. Giant turtle made of guns. Um. So I think when I was doing this, I remembered that there's one item. So from, uh, well, just from this big tree head west, and then... I can't remember what the item is, but there is something that we... Well, we did, we, I guess we didn't miss it, but I just caught it before we missed it. I think we have to break a statue open at a rune bear. Yes. That now... Now I understand why we had to deal with a rune bear. I'm like, I know we have to deal with one, but like, why? But it's, yeah, it's a statue. Again, yeah. you could just use the quit out method, th theoretically. There's the rune bear, so get his attention. It's one of the white rune bears as well, so they're even stronger. Oh, apparently it just doesn't give a fuck. Okay, cool. Epic. No, it decided you weren't worth his time. Now he's decided we absolutely are worth his time, though. Well, as would you if you'd just been stabbed with a big pointy stick. Yeah, but if he was running away, I'm like, ugh, like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you'd just give up. This is why you're not rune bear material. So um, for that, we get three Smith and Stone 7s and a Smith and Stone 8. Not only that, that rune bear smashed that thing with a fucking, like, roar attack. Terrifying. <laughs> so now, as you can see, there's the Wandering Mausoleum. This one has the bell, which means it can duplicate remembrances. <sighs> shard bearer remembrances, specifically. No, shard bearer so, remembrances, yeah, sorry. Morgoth, Moog, Rikard, Melania. Uh, Godric and Rodan. Because the other ones can't do that. If it doesn't have the bell, it can't duplicate those ones. That is a completely unnecessary, arbitrary distinction that they made, and it really bugs me. Of all the fucking little minuscule distinctions they made in the game, that one really bugs me. Yeah. You are seeing a fun trick here, though. Um, the R2s have a persistent hitbox when you're on torrent. Uh, <laughs> torrent is dead, gone. Huh? Torrent is no more. <laughs> Yeah, he did just get vaporized. Um, <laughs> yeah. But the the persistent hitbox means you can ride around the foot in a circle and break a bunch of the uh, little skulls. spectral skulls in one go. So, yeah. Useful little time save. It takes forever to get these things to come down. 
as soon as you see the rocks in the middle start to fall, um, you'll know there you've done go. it. Then just, there you go. Get the hell out of dodge. Do not get sat on. Now, this will also um, despawn any mausoleum knights that are in the area, so that's useful. Indeed. And now we are heading to the Apostate Derelict, where we are now going to finish Latena's quest, if you remember her from 30 parts ago. <laughs> she was the Albanoric woman at the far end of the cave in Leonia, along the west coast. Um, she agreed to come with you when you had the Helic Dream Medallion. She asked you to bring her here. She lets the birthing droplet into the giant Albanoric woman. Gives you a somber ancient dragon smithing stone as your reward, and then you get to keep her as a spirit ash, which is nice because I fully expected her to just disappear forever after yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah. Also picked up the silver mirror shield just there. That is, uh, I think, part of Loretta's gear, actually. Oh yeah. Yeah, I think it's the shield that Loretta wields. So that plus Loretta's halberd, war sickle, and Loretta's armor is the perfect Loretta cosplay. So there you go. So heading back to the round table, and now we have, uh, we, we should have enough uh, smith and stones to, uh, apart of this, <clears throat> so we've still got smith and stone nines to go through, never mind, but the point is we're now, oh no, 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 we don't, there isn't a smith and stone nine, I fucking knew that, I don't know what I saw there, but the point is, is we've, fi we've fully upgraded our great stars, cool, nice and sexy. The final damage spike will experience, really. Yeah, I don't even know why I somehow gaslit myself for like half a second into thinking that Smith and Stone Nines existed in this game. I, I do not understand what I just saw on my screen. May have been Somber Stone Nine for the pull though. <clears throat> that might have been it. Yes, that that probably was it. So now we're putting. All right, dog, I got you. I'll fill in the gaps. <laughs> Thanks, man. I do appreciate that. So now we are putting on the uh, the holy that. So the the faith increase crystal tier the holy damage increase crystal tier and then we're also putting on the uh sacred scorpion charm now we're going to put it to night time because we have to do a death bird now this one definitely the hardest one in the game it's actually insane how fucking tough this death bird is even through all the sacred damage we're about to put into it so just be aware of how tough this one is and this is definitely another one of those enemies that you're going to be glad that you took the Radigan Source Seal off for just because it deals that much fucking damage. So, heading off the edge of this cliff here, there's a secret little golden ring 13. And now we are heading into this... I guess this is the, the very opposite end of the ravine. And the Death Bird will uh, show up. So, yeah. get your flask on and then just try and get this thing some good hits on its head. I mean, that's like good damage, but compared to the amount of damage we're doing to the other ones... It's, uh, it's, it's a laughable amount. And this thing can literally just one-shot you out of nowhere again. It's, it's like Theodoric's in that sense. Yeah, that's just Snowfield scaling for you. This thing is uh, overtuned, I would say. It hits exceptionally hard, builds up really big frostbite, can death blight you. It's just all round not a pleasant battling experience. Although we do manage to do it relatively painlessly by the looks. Yeah. Because I remember just, this did give us some trouble. It um, did, it did, it did. Just uh, get your hits in when you can and just be careful. Don't don't die a hero, you know? Yeah. Because unlike some of the others, you can't summon to help you with this one, so all yeah. the focus is on you. This is true, you can't summon for this one. But you can summon for the one in Mountaintops. Series of question marks. Uh, oh, what? <sighs> Whatever. I don't know what the distinction is, but your reward yeah. is Explosive Ghost Flame. Um, that is a sorcery that does exactly what you think it does, spreads ghost flame around, and explodes. Um, that deals magic damage, builds up frostbite. It's pretty good, but it does require both intelligence and faith to be able to cast. So a very specific build can take advantage of it. So now we are heading to... Uh, oh fuck, what's, what's this place called again? Ordina. That's it, yes. Yes. And, uh, a few things little... to do around Ordina before we actually get into the meat and potatoes of it, though. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so this this whole area has, like, a puzzle, quote-unquote. Um, it's actually just a huge pain in the ass. but luckily, we have a great method to make it a not pain in the ass. So presumably we're putting Lion's Claw back on. Yep. All reliable. It's like rock and rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> it literally, it can't fail. Good old rock. Nothing beats that. Nothing beats it! 
common knowledge. So, hilariously, I forgot to... Ah, there we go, right. <laughs> there we go. So I put the Dragon Crest Talisman uh, 1 back on. Where the fuck did we get the, the plus 2 Dragon Crest Talisman? Uh, Faramazula. That's the Great Shield Talisman. Or is that no, it the plus 2? That's in Halig 3. Oh! Right, okay, never mind. Wow, those are really close together. Yeah, they are. <laughs> I mean, at least it sort of makes sense because Halig Tree is harder than Faramazula, so... Uh, with, a, with our method, probably not, actually. <laughs> I mean, for us, you know, no. But for your average <laughs> player, like... <laughs> for, for the layman. Yeah, exactly. For the everyman, you know. <laughs> Who this guide was for. This is for you, Joe Average. <laughs> Hi. So for that, we get the Rotten Jewelist Trousers and the Rotten Great Axe. Now, back to Ordina, and now there's a couple of small items to pick up. You could just ignore these. Nothing really that important. Um, but otherwise, yeah, then it's... We're, we are on to... You definitely don't need them. But we are on to the, uh, the puzzle thing. So... Puzzle series of question marks. <laughs> yeah. So the puzzle is like... How do you even fucking explain this? Hefty beast bones in the boxes, by the way. But yeah, the puzzle is... Go on, intent. The, it, so it's an ever jail, and then you can't leave Ordina, and then you have to light three, um, like, torches. And then, once you've lit the three torches, it unlocks the door for you. But specifically under those stairs, there is the black knife set, and that is actually quite cool. Um... But we have a really great method for doing this part, and because really the reason why this bit is so annoying is because there's a ton of Albanoric archers that just pepper you with spells the whole time you're doing this. But if you actually put on uh, Assassin's Gambit, they just completely leave you alone. So you can just do whatever it is you need to do, they can't even see you, they can't hear you, and then you can just light the three torches and get on with your day. So, quite cool. So before... Indeed it is. Before we get into it, though, I do want to mention that there are ways and means of... Um, I was going to say, I'm, I'm certain we didn't miss an item there. No. <laughs> yeah, we picked <laughs> up me worried for a time, second yeah. there. <laughs> um, no, um, there are a few ways to deal with the Albanoric archers to make them slightly less annoying. Number one, you can put them to sleep. So if you have St. Trina's arrows or sleep pots... You can just make them go night night for a full 60 seconds, and then you've got all the time in the world to do what you need to do. You can use the jar cannon or any sufficiently powerful weapon to knock them off of the roofs so that they can't pepper you while you're up and climbing and doing what you need to do. So that is also useful. And if you have any sufficiently powerful ranged spells, um, you can just kill them at a distance before they become a problem. The other thing you've got to worry about in this dungeon are some invisible black knife assassins. Now, they can be a bit of a pain in the ass, but they do spawn in specific locations. So once you learn where they are, they're not too hard to get around. You yes. can also equip the sentry's torch to be able to see them, which is very convenient. Um, and that little esoteric knowledge for you works even when you're just seeing their ghosts wandering around before you even enter the Evergill. So you can equip the sentry's torch right now, Figure out where those Black Knife Assassins are while they can't attack you, and then you can retain that knowledge for when you go in so that you know the areas to avoid. Now, a, a, an even better method is to just follow the exact path that we take. And we've got the Sentry's Torch out, so that's something. But, uh, yeah, we'll enter the River Jail, and then once we put on Assassin's Gambit, that's pretty much it. It's just a run at the end. So there we go, there's Assassin's Gambit on, and nothing can see us. Well, they can see us, but we have to be extremely close, and they also can't hear us, so we can just run about. Um, so you want to take this... The assassins just appeared there on the left. Yep. So you want to take this wide angle around the back, and then head up uh, this particular church tower. I think when you get to the top, Assassin's Gambit will wear off. So before you climb this tower... You should pop it again. Yeah. Yes. If you time it right, you can do it basically without ever getting seen. 
which is quite so cool. Back on. Honestly, the utility of this, um, I will admit, we probably underutilized. So there's uh, an assassin right there. But as we've taken this particular path in, and because we've got assassin's gambit on, he can't see us. So what you can do here is run up this banister and then kind of clip onto this railing. And as a result, you don't need to go all the way around. You can just jump up like this and it's much, much faster. So, and this allows you to avoid an amount of enemies doing it as well. So, little tip for you. I think there's actually four things you've got to light. There's three at the top of the towers and then there's one in the courtyard. But if you get the one in the courtyard last, that's advisable because oh, yeah, the one in the courtyard is being directly guarded by a black knife assassin. So yeah. you want to aggro that thing after you've done everything else. So if you want, you could try and do this without Assassin's Gambit on to just see how much of a pain in the arse this is. Because genuinely, uh, yeah, you'd just be getting shot like this the entire fucking time without it. We're just going to beat up a crippled woman on a roof who was taking sanctuary up here because she didn't want to die. Lol, yeah. we have a jump button now. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yep, so, yeah, grabbing this... sconce number three and then into the courtyard, get the fourth one, and that's all Dean had done. Relatively painlessly. We only had to fight one thing. I remember doing this the first time and absolutely like, tearing my fucking hair out at it as well. Yep. And all that stress could have been avoided with the simple use of Assassin's Gambit. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, there is a Black Knife Assassin down here. You should, he should show up. Yep, but there we are is. just gonna... As soon as you light this, and they can't jump up here... Haha. Teehee. <laughs> yeah, that's Ordina Finito. Done. Yeah. Finished. Painless. Fit yeah, I was going to say, it's very, very painless for, like, an area that was, like, quite extremely annoying the first time. Absolutely painless. So here we are. But now, uh, that that teleporter takes us to Michaela's Halig Tree, which is the last area in the game. Now, there's a couple of areas we're going to do before this. You can actually, at this point, the way they're scaled, do them in any order, actually. So that means that you could do Farmazula, Morgan's Palace, or Halig Tree in any order. But... We're going to do it in that order, and then otherwise, that is it for part 40. And okay, there we go, that's Snowfield done. Join us in part 41, where we're going to be doing Moog's Palace. Now, other than liking and subscribing, you can follow us on Twitter. You can also follow us on Twitch, where we will be streaming once the DLC is out. And if you're feeling especially generous, you can sling us some cash on Patreon if you're so inclined. But the best thing you can do is just comment anything. Just comment anything. Go on. Anything. Two seconds. Go on. Anyway, catch you in the next part.